I'm Stanley Hartshorn Rowe. Uh, my Hartshorn side of my family came to Hamilton before there was a Hamilton in 1794, two years after the land barons had uh, bought the land from the Indians. And then there was a late comer, uh, another great 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 grandfather. Uh, he was a Baptist, became a Baptist in his 30s, began preaching in Connecticut. And he came here in 1815 when he was about 40 years old. And four years later, uh, he being a good Baptist uh, and member of the church, it was one of those who gave his dollar, his book, and a prayer, and was one of the Colgate 13. When I was growing up, we were very different than we are now. We were much more agrarian community. Dairy farming was big, it was all the support industries. Community spirit was nurtured by, oh, take my, my father. We'd milk the cows, and at night, cool the milk, milk again in the morning, and all the milk in the cans would uh, take him to the milk station where he got to talk with other farmers. Then he'd go to the feed store, buy two or three bags of grain. He'd talk to some more people. He might stop at the grocery store on the way home. So there were always interaction among people, and there were a lot of support industries, as there always are around uh, a main industry, people who sell farm machinery, sell grain, sell... We had, we had a... Uh, our own uh, horseshoer, uh, blacksmith, in in town, and uh, of course later on there were welders and and, and uh, all those kinds of occupations, and many of those occupations are no longer no longer with us. Uh, farmers now milk the cows. No one ever actually sees the milk. A tank truck drives up, sucks it all out of the out of a cooling tank, and and takes it away. Uh, grain comes in a huge truck and is augered off. Life is a lot simpler now. Um, farmers don't get all stove in by the age time they're 40 because they have machinery to do things that we did by hand. You asked about important people. Uh, they just closed the one-room schoolhouses and we had a two-room school in, in Lebanon. And Mrs. Upham, my first, second, and third grade teacher, the kind of teacher who recognized what each kid was and, and worked with what he had. So when I was a little advanced for my classmates, I'd get to clap the erasers outside to du get the dust out of them, or I'd go to the little library, and I think I read every, li every book in the, uh, in the library. But she was uh, very supportive, very nurturing. Many years later, I'd retired from the Army. I was back here, and there was one of those educational foo-foo-ahs going on, whether phonics or sight reading was the way to go. And I ran into her and I took her to lunch. And uh, Mrs. Upham, I always called her Mrs. Upham. I never in my life called her Lucia, even to the day she died at 100. But Mrs. Upham, what technique did you use to teach reading? And she said, well, I, I used a mixture of phonics and sight reading. And now in your case, you could read when you came to school, and, but she remembered, you know, she knew every kid and everything about every kid. It was, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. And one of the, well, I think the best teacher I ever had, and that's uh, several colleges and uh, high schools and whatnot. People like her make it a joy to learn. And if you're curious about something, they nurture you and, and point you in the right direction where you can find that book where you can find a story about some subject that you showed a little interest in. Mrs. Upham, I mentioned earlier, lived to be a hundred. We had a big hundredth birthday party at the, at the Colgate Inn and a, a lot of people came. And when she died, she went from Madison Lane to the funeral parlor. Quick end to a very long life. And uh, it's, it's the way to go. If, 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 if you're lucky, you get to live a long time. And if you're really lucky, you don't get to live too long.